now that India is entering lockdown 4.0, Ambassador Fabian, what are your thoughts? Has the lockdown delivered the intended results? Thank you for uh, yet another interesting question of national concern. Now, you mentioned lockdown 4.0. Well, this is what I call the media talk, which is, I'm afraid, rather confusing. But more importantly, the media have not, uh, so far, I mean the mainstream media, with a few honorable exceptions, have not uh, dealt with this matter with clarity and in depth. <clears throat> For example, no media, po mainstream media, I repeat, pointed out when the Prime Minister announced abruptly, I emphasize the word abruptly, the national lockdown, that he should not have done that so abruptly, that the nation should have been given some notice. But uh, our media went on to praise the Prime Minister and to exult over the fact that uh, India had the biggest lockdown. Well, <laughs> I don't know why we should be <clears throat> claiming credit for having the biggest lockdown. Now, that the lockdown was abruptly announced, that badly planned or more accurately, no planning at all, was made abundantly clear when the whole nation witnessed the tragic plight of millions of interstate migrants. We do not know as yet how many are there. I asked a senior official in the Delhi government how many are there. After checking with his colleagues, he came back and told me that the Delhi government had no idea at all. Well, now, the tardiness, the incompetence, the incoherence, and above all, the cruelty of the government's response to the plight of the interstate migrants is a blot on India's democracy. A polity that does not care for the weakest and the poorest cannot claim to be a democracy. Remember Mahatma Gandhi's talisman. He said, whenever you are in doubt in a matter of public policy, think of the face of the poorest and the weakest individual you have ever come across and ask yourself whether what you are going to do will help him or her. Now, the new India seems to have forgotten the Mahatma. Now, there is a confusion conceptual confusion between social distancing and lockdown. Social distancing is per se in itself desirable for arresting the contagion and also for reversing it. But lockdown is desirable only to the extent it promotes social distancing. In other words, lockdown is not a good, is not good in itself. And the thermonuclear approach, which 
the Indian government has pursued does not make much sense. As I said earlier, the media exulted over the biggest lockdown. It was bigger than that of China. Little did they bother to mention that the Hubei province in China under the lockdown did not lack food and that they did not have millions of inter-province migrants taking to the streets without food, without money and without transport. So the question is why did we get it all wrong? This is not rocket science. We got it wrong because there was no cabinet paper. Before any such major decision, a cabinet paper should have been prepared. It would have said that uh, it should have been announced with X days notice and it would have also listed actions should be taken before and after the lockdown. Well, that is a sad state of governance in India. Let us hope that the media will speak without fear. The judiciary will remain vigilant and fearless. And above all, the government will correct itself with alacrity. I'm sorry I've spoken longer than I intended, but thank you for lending me your ears. We shall talk to each other very soon. Nowadays, there is a lot of emphasis on Make in India. Can we look at Make in India in the defense sector? Thank you for that question. Important and pertinent in our times. Make in India is a necessary project that deserves more attention that it, than it has received. And by attention, I mean action, not words. Now, confining ourselves to the defense sector, a bit of history might help. Post-1947, India lacked airplanes, tanks, ships, even bullets main supplier was the United Kingdom, a reluctant supplier and also supply against the British pound sterling, that is hard currency, which India was short of. Now, to fast forward history, in 1961, the United States offered two squadrons of fighter aircraft F-104 to Pakistan and a little later the Soviets made an offer on MIG, a supersonic fighter aircraft. Now the Soviet offer had many attract attractive uh, aspects to it. One, technology transfer. After buying a number of uh, uh, engines, in this case, from the Soviet Union, India could manufacture the engines in India. Two, there was no restric restriction on, you, on what use India might uh, put to put those engines. Three, and this is very important, the payment could be in Indian rupees. Well, there was strong opposition. Indian Air Force opposed. President Kennedy opposed. He even roped in the UK Prime Minister. But uh, V.K. Krishnamenon, the Defence Minister of the day, prevailed. And uh, the deal was signed in October 1962. We all have heard of uh, DRDO, Defense Research and Development Organization. 
you know, which has given us Prithvi, Agni and other missiles and lots of other things. It was established in 1958. Now, there is curious uh, history behind it. Uh, if you go to the website of DRDO, you will never know that uh, it was established by Defence Minister Vika Krishnamenon against stout opposition from the three service chiefs. Now, that came out in uh, 2006 when APJ Abdul Kalam, who was, he was president then, but in 1996, as chief of DRDO, he had commissioned a report on uh, the formation of DRDO, a report which got published because the president insisted only in 2006. And from there it is clear that Krishnamayanan had imposed it on the defense chiefs. Well, the fact of the matter is that India has now emerged as the second largest arms importer in the world. According to the Stockholm-based CIPRI, during the period 2015 to 2019, India is the second largest arms importer after Saudi Arabia. Now, let me put it this way. We need to import arms and technology when we need it. But unless we have a clearly defined goal of self-reliance in the defense sector, we 